Good evening, Mr. Lightfoot. How are you, sir? I, I'm fine. Thank you very much. What a pleasure. Thanks for coming yes, to my home. Yes, thank you, George. It's nice to be here. You as See well. you again. Again, that's right. We've, we've spoken before on, we, on the tube, on TV and everything. This is much more intimate, and this is fun. Cause yes, can, it's really cool here. I love this place. Thank you. We can play all kinds of records. Yeah, you played yeah. 91 shows last year? We played, yes, we did. Do you get the same thing out of it that you used to get the touring? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, 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 the music is good, and we 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 work on the, on the music all the time, and we think about it. We we get into the old catalog, and we mm-hmm. we find those gems which we would like to have done. We, we, we would like to have seen become hits mm-hmm. uh, from the old days, and some of it works real good. I'm doing stuff right now, really, that the uh, couple of the people really haven't heard very much at all. Uh, about in the past. When you're a songwriter and and a recording artist who becomes so popular for so many hits, I often wonder if the songs that become hits are the ones you thought would become hits. Or you think, oh, I've had other records that could have been just as big. Uh, I I knew I, I I wasn't sure of a couple of them, but I was sure about the about Sundown. Yeah. I was I had not a clue that if you could read my mind. I would do anything because I had a heck of a hangover the day I, I cut that one too. I'd like to have had another couple of passes on that one, but I must, have, when you wrote I it must have done something correct, you know. <laughs> Wait a second, how many of your hits were recorded with a hangover? Well, a, a few back in those days. I mean, I, I became a full fledged alcoholic, you know, through the seventies, and and of course had to let it go in, in nineteen eight by nineteen eighty two. Because uh, I was wearing out the, the 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 welcome mat at the record company by that point, so I really had to stop, and I was ready to uh, resign for my last four albums, and then uh, uh, I had a, my, my relationship broke up, and uh, uh, at the same time, and you know, it, it was uh, just a time to stop. Right? Did it affect the way you could view uh, some of my friends who go, either if they go into a program or do they just they just stop? They cold turkey it. Their clarity changes there is a far more clear view of the world and that can affect their art well our, my last four albums were, were a lot better I, I i made four albums after i stopped and and i, I actually think that uh, uh they were they were better albums a lot of people talking about how toronto has changed over the years and they often talk about a lot of the city stuff that's changed but you've stayed here the whole you've seen the change musically what have you noticed uh, there's a, there's a lot more going on, and and I mean when I first did, uh, started out, there were perhaps only two or three recording studios in in town, you know. But uh, <laughs> that would be like around about 1960. There was Sound Canada and Hallmark <laughs> Studio, you know. Uh, uh, and I went in. We we recorded there in these places, and uh, they were they were the only places available to record in. Now there's lots of recording studios now. Uh, and in uh, fact, every bedroom can be a recording studio with the right computer, right? Yeah, I know one of my kids made a whole album in in his bedroom. You know, you know, it's, it's my son Eric. I mean, uh, uh, had already done two albums with other groups and finally made a whole album all by himself using samples, uh, right in uh, right in the, the room where he lived. He was living at my house. I watched him do it. Did he sample any of your classics? Uh, no, no, he was he was all original, oh, right. all, all originally. Uh, uh, you, you know, he, he wrote his own stuff, and he was with a, a grunge band before that, and, and that came out of high school. Uh, you know, it was, it was that story. But I, I, I even tried to find him a, a label, but uh, they were saying, "Now, Gord, you know, <laughs> like my nephew over here, you know, and my own kid over here, you know." And. Uh, uh, but but I did get a, less, a listening, you know, from a couple of people. But I, I couldn't get it placed, you know. Uh, that's what you run up against, and you, you feel like you're being nepotistic. I, right. Uh, I have a daughter right now who's aspiring, and uh, uh, my daughter Meredith, uh, uh, Meredith Moon, she uses she uses her mother's maiden name, mm-hmm. uh, is, is aspiring to do it, and I'm, I'm coaching her, and and. You know, it's kind of interesting. So she's doing a couple of my tunes, but mostly she tries to like, write her own songs. She's only 21, so... Get her to send us some songs. We'll take a listen to them. 
if we, she could, if she could just get something down, I would be. <laughs> well, we've got mics. We've got a recording be, session. <laughs> be happy to do that. <laughs> It'd be all right. The, um, you know, show me somebody that's finished. You know, when you were uh, when you were coming up, when you were a kid before we all, when people started to hear of you, yeah. did you come across people who acted as mentors? Did you meet someone who was who was kind of giving you a hand? Yeah, there was lots of people because it was the folk revival was was happening, and there was lots and lots of artists who to uh to listen to and learn from and and of course the, the the main person was Bob Dylan but then there were many others you know there was Ian and Sylvia Ian, Ian Tyson was it was a great uh, influence on uh, and and uh, you know the Peter Paul and Mary the people that, that uh, we worked with that, uh, that we were around at that time uh, you know the, the later the band and and uh uh, there was Pete Seeger. There was there was Bob Gibson. I don't know if you ever heard of Bob Gibson. He was one of the unsung heroes of the folk revival, but uh, just just never got that that record. Never got that break. I think Gibson played with you at the fo- played at the folk festival. Did he in '65? He yeah. was on that bill. So was well. So was Dylan, obviously, on that bill as well. I think that might be the greatest live lineup, maybe in the history of music. Was the '65 Newport Folk Festival. That was uh, that was when Bob uh, brought brought the the drum kit on. He uh, did on stage, and, and and Albert and and Albert Grossman and and uh, Alan Lomax had actually got into a wrestling match over that. I, I was there. I saw I saw a wrestling match take place about the uh, going electric. <laughs> Bob Dylan should uh, bring his drums on stage. Well, uh, we can come back to that. that. We can come back to that, but not just that. Sun House played on that build. I mean, everybody played on that bill. It was an incredible. Yeah, yeah it was. It was an interesting, uh, interesting, uh, very interesting show. Well, did you get involved in the wrestling match? No, no. I just, I just, wa- I just watched. <laughs> Whose side would you have been on? I'll tell you who was. Uh, Joan Baez was was there. Uh, Donovan was there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, Richard Farina and, and Mimi Farina were there. It was uh, they had a, they were in the middle of a circle of people. It was a dry day, and the the dust was flying. The <laughs> dust was 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 flying. It was well, very, what very were funny. you thinking when you were watching it? Well, I I, I, I was actually uh, uh, t- I was shocked. I, I, I was shocked to, to see this taking place. I mean, it was. Uh, it, 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 you know, it's one of my good stories. All you could do is really just stand there and watch. And whose side would you have been on? Eventually, they were up. I, I was on nobody's side. It had to do with the purest approach. At that point, the uh, folk music was still tra- traditional, and yeah. and and Bob was about to break that mold because it, would, it was the first time there had been a you know a drum kit on right. on the stage at new at the Newport Folk Festival. It's pretty great, though. When an artist can recognize that now is the time to do something for him, right? Yeah. yeah. He said you're a mentor to him as well. Well, so they say, but I, I, I very highly doubt that. Uh, uh, I, I, there, there been. He has said many complimentary things uh, about me. He, uh, he's been very kind. He's been very kind to me. I, I think. Well, Gordon Lightfoot, well deserved. I mean, your catalog is <laughs> kind of what inspires so Bob many Dylan people. Has been, been kind, very kind. Uh, I mean, you're part of that moment when, when people write songs today and they talk about an era that inspired them. They're talking about your era, and they're talking about you and the guys and the women that you played with. In the moment, did you know something big and special was happening? I did because I, I sat in Joni Mitchell's kitchen one night with Tom Rush in Detroit, and she played about four or five of those tunes that were sitting right at the kitchen table that she had on that first of al- first album. And we, we, Tom picked up one of the tunes immediately, and and she she just rattled off about five of them. Right, she just right played there, them for right you at the kitchen table. That was when she she and Chuck were still together, and mm-hmm. the. Uh, one time they, they they let me use their apartment for a week. They were on the road. I was playing at the at the uh, Living End or, or the Chessmate. I forget I forget which one it was in Detroit. But uh, Joni, I wouldn't have anything to do with the Beatles because because every time I'd have a new record, there'd be a we'd have another Beatles album in our face. <laughs> <laughs> Something to compete you know, against. So, <laughs> they had eaten up all the air time that was left. From 1963 oh, to 1970, they put out a lot of records. I, I know. <laughs> the, the folk music 
died when you know <laughs> at, at that point you know it was unavoidable it just had to happen and uh, you know but but she left me with the uh, the revolver album by the beatles and i i i, I listened to it and that was when i got hooked on the on the beatles and Revolvers. I had about four or five albums before that. And right. I wouldn't pay any, pay any attention to them because they were they were. I was competing against them in the trying to get on the charts. <laughs> so when you first put on Revolver, the first song, what did you think? Well, it, it was a great album, and it was it was crisp. It was it was very 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 uh, a, a very special, you know, live live feeling sound to it, and. Uh, you know, I I don't know how they did it. It was like with with George Martin. You know, uh, having access to all the people that they worked with, and eventually having people who would assist them. You know, in, in finishing stuff and and adding things. And uh, they they did most of the writing though for for their first I, I guess six or seven albums. They did all the writing, mm-hmm. but uh, but eventually it had to to. Uh, be sort of farmed out, so to speak, and finished. And and, uh, and George Martin, who was a, a, a keyboard person, George Martin was a, mm-hmm. a piano person, uh, was their producer, and uh, they got out some great songs. They wrote some great songs. I remember talking to Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin about why he didn't write songs anymore. And he said, maybe I've got nothing left to say. You know, he said, you've written a lot of songs. Maybe at this point I don't have anything to say, so why force a song? Can you relate to that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that I have, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> Just at that point in <laughs> your life, we're still... yeah. No, I mean at that point in his life, he's like, I don't have anything to share at this yeah, moment. Yeah, we we could, you know, all of my record obligations uh, were finished by 1998. All tw- all 19 albums that I had made, and then I made one more after that. But uh, I. I I, I, we started doing shows and, and, and doing a lot of touring and we loved that and we still do and uh, I, I got more family involvement I had more kids I had another marriage uh, had I not got married the second time I probably would have had another album you know mm-hmm. it, it, uh, it, it's, it's a serious thing I'll see how my third works out <laughs> that one just got started so far so good so, so far so good <laughs> Well, I've known the woman almost seven years, and uh, it, it, after a while, it takes on a momentum of its own. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're a songwriter too, right? Your, your relationships appear in your work. I've, a lot of my stuff got into my work, and, and I'm paying for it now <laughs> because they look back and they say, "Now, who is this about?" And when, like, when are you going to do one about me? You know? Did your daughter ask you to change a lyric that you perform live? Uh, yeah, that's a, that was done on the, on the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, the uh, on that particular song, I had suggested that it may have been a, a, a hatch cover uh, problem that caused the, mm-hmm. the, the, that event to to occur. Uh, and and this was uh, reflecting upon the the deck hands who were supposed to be looking after the uh, uh, the hatch covers uh, that night, and uh, which then relayed itself off to the the ladies' committee in. Madison, Wisconsin, that we kept in touch with all the time, and it was the it was the the captain's daughter, the first mate's wife, uh, a twenty one year old kid, the son of uh, uh, Ruth Hudson, uh, and uh, who the heck was the fourth? Uh, her father was one of the deckhands, and it was reflecting upon them that they it may have been an heir, may have aired. Uh, so uh, about eight, eight years ago, dive detectives did a, uh, a special for a National Geographic whereby they proved that it could not possibly have been, been the hatch covers. But news and didn't travel they, the same way back then. They, scientifically. Right. And, and, they, they, and at that point, I, I changed the line because I, I heard some people talking about it one day on, on the radio. And, I, and, I, and I, I started thinking about Ruth Hudson, who is, who is now about, probably about 85 years old, uh, and thinking about, uh, you know, Cheryl Rosman and, and thinking about uh, Dolores McSorley and, and thinking about, about uh, Janice Armagost, who were the four women I, mm-hmm. 
uh, and uh, how they must feel about this because, and, and discovered that they were, had been disturbed for all these years. They'd been disturbed about the fact that their men had been on duty. Mm-hmm. And I had stated boldly right in about the second verse or the third verse that a hatchway had mm-hmm. given in. And uh, that went uh, went like that for years. So knowing that they would be coming out and knowing that uh, I would be able to set people straight on it, I actually rewrote the line, and the line was, for the, at 7 p.m., a main hatchway came in. I said, at 7 p.m., it grew dark, it was then. That's like a true folk singer's... Uh, it took me three three weeks to figure that one out. <laughs> to change. How to change the main hatchway game in. But a, but a good folk singer, should, a good any singer, should have responsibility to the subject sometimes, right? So the next time Ruth, Ruth Hudson showed up, it was at, was at uh, the school up in Traverse City, Michigan, where they have an amphitheater. And I was able to get out there and do it for her and make her feel good about it. And by this time, she was about 70 years old, 72. What did she say? 70, 78. They were, they were pleased, and so was Cheryl Rosman, because her dad, uh, Ransom, his name was Ransom, Cundy, Ransom, was one of the other uh, uh, deckhands that were in charge of those hatch covers. And uh, it got proved that those hatch covers were not, not the to problem, blame. <laughs> scientifically. Gordon Lightfoot is here. We're just talking about not just his song. What's the song that you hear today uh, that you love? That's not one of your own, but just a song that when you hear it on the, come on the radio, it's yours. Which one? Any song. What song do you love to hear now? When are you, we're going to play a song. Are you talking about somebody else? Yeah, somebody else, yeah. Well, uh, that's a very good... <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question, being the, the self-centered person that I am. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, there, there's, there's so much uh, professional and, and professional, uh, it, 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 it's reached a, a professional level, really, overall, it is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And, and the talent that is involved uh, uh, is, is unbelievable. Uh, what, what 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 I mean by that is I I'm really impre- impressed with with what I hear. Right, and it didn't used to be, it used to be a little different, didn't because it? Because of the expertise that these kids got these days. But his expertise they, they, they got it. Expertise isn't in feeling though. Like the people can play, people can record, people can promote, but the feeling, you know that that other thing, yeah, that makes a musician grand. Are you hearing stuff like that? Yes, and, and of course I'm hearing uh, good tempos and, and, and great intonation, mm-hmm. uh, interesting songs of a different sort of a, of a feel to them. The songs are a lot different. Uh, I, I can take... Uh, can, can I mention yeah. Justin's name without sure. getting myself... In... You can say whatever you want. You're Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> what, Justin uh, Bieber? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, that, that was really an excellent album. Uh, his first album. So you're driving to the gym so, on a Wednesday morning. Uh, Are you listening to the Justin Bieber record in your car? I, I heard one of his, re- his yeah. records in my car. Were you singing years along years ago? No, but I but I was impressed with the with, with what I could see had gone into it. How old were you when you started to think that maybe some stuff in your personal life was falling apart? I don't mean relationships. I mean like if the partying or the drinking so or whatever. Right after my my first marriage, and I think that was by the time when I was about. About twenty four, right? I got married real young, so Justin's really young, yeah, and yeah. and starting to walk into that same space. Yeah, it was. Uh, it went for seven years. Uh, two great kids out of it. They're all growing up, got families of their own, got grandchildren with them. Mm-hmm. Well, when it was going on, when you were in in the the darker periods, were there people around you helping, or or were you open to it? Yeah, my my sister my my sister helped me to. Uh, uh, to stop drinking, and uh, and and so did a doctor, and and so did a, f- a few other people. So did the record company. They all played a role. Mr. Austin, the president of Reprise Records, was <laughs> Mo. Was, <laughs> you know, actually pulled me into uh, into his office one day. Uh, another time, he, he I was attending a Frank Sinatra session, and he pulled me aside there and talked to me about it a little bit. That was fun. What was happening? <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it 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 had to it, it had to happen. Yeah. Had to, what was happening at the Frank Sinatra session? Well, he was recording uh, uh, cover recordings, and uh, I was in there the second night and uh, invited in. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, had, he, had attempt, he had attempted, uh, if you could read my mind, 
the night before mm-hmm. uh, with a they had about an 18 piece orchestra in there it was a big big stuff the, the control room was, was filled with suits filled with suits how do you feel about that doesn't sound like it's very fun <laughs> and he, he said well I mean everybody was there Jerry Weintraub was there everybody was there they offered me a deal too but I, I turned it down at one, at one point but uh, he said that last night that the engineer pulled me aside, Lee Hirschberg. He said last night, Frank took your song and threw it on the floor and said, "I can't sing this." You know, so we had a, a chuckle over that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the time that I was in, he was working on "You're the Sunshine of My Life" by uh, our little buddy from from St- St- Stevie uh, Stevie Wonder. Oh wow! Uh, so you're okay. the sunshine of my life, and I loved it. And I thought it was great. And yet, they they never it never got used. So I I didn't feel so bad. Did you go and talk to Frank about your song afterwards? No, I, the, only, the only time I ever spoke to him was on the telephone. <laughs> Just say hello, sir. No, he he asked me to send send him some material. What's that call like when you get a call from Frank Sinatra? Well, I was told that, that to expect a call from Frank Sinatra by my publishing lawyer in New York mm-hmm. earlier in the day said, Mr. Sinatra will be calling you at 5 o'clock this evening. And that I was there. At that time, I was living over on, on, a, on a, small, a smaller house in Rosedale, smaller scale. And I took the call, and uh, he said, Gordon, you know, Gordon, how are you? You know, <laughs> really, really PR. Uh, of course, I met him at the, at, the, at the session, too, very, very brief. I met him once, uh, too, in Palm Springs when I was down there uh, on a weekend one time. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he said, "Send me some songs." That's it, and I did. I sent him five tunes, mm-hmm. and uh, they didn't do any of them. Maybe your songs are just too special. Do no you have problem. A, a cover that someone's done of yours that you loved? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, there are about there are so many uh, that I, I actually don't know where to begin. Well, that's my uh, greats of all time. I, I would say. Uh, Shall I start at the top? Or just pick a couple, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Elvis doing Early Morning Rain. I mean, come on, Gordon. That's amazing. Uh, and, and Barbara Barbara doing, uh, if you could read my mind. I mean, Barbara Streisand did a wonderful version of If You Could Read My Mind. So when you first hear that, were you, do you ever have an opportunity to be on the drive and on the radio, you hear it, and what that, what that moment, this kid from Aurelia U and Stephen Leacock, and you were in Toronto, like, all of a sudden you got the king of rock and roll, you got... Barbara, you already have the relationship with Dylan. Like your yeah. life is just really blown and I got up. Peter Paul and Mary with a hit with a song called "For Loving Me," mm-hmm. which I hate. I won't even sing it because <laughs> I sang it for twenty years. I, I, I sang it for twenty years, but I, I stopped singing finally. Uh, walking out of the bedroom in the morning with my, you know, my three-month-old son in my arms, mm-hmm. and hearing all of a sudden Peter Paul and Mary having a hit with one of my tunes on the radio that's not bad I'll never forget it and and it resulted in a, in a great great thing for me Ian set that up Ian Tyson set that up for me it was a very unselfish thing that he did and um, I, I was offered in a management deal and by their people and, and a, a publishing it, it all happened at, and how old were you then? 25 26 maybe right. 26 and your life really changed after that yeah, well, I went to. I kept writing. I, I made five albums in five years, mm-hmm. and uh, then I got my Warner Brothers deal in 1970. Did you ever feel pressure? You know, when at that time artists were you have to turn out a lot of music, and especially when you have a couple of hits, the the, the pressure to repeat and to continue that. Did that ever get on you? Yeah, but I had a band too, and I had. Uh, but this time, you know, you had to. You had to do it. You you were under contract. Well, now. even more pressure. Now then. you have a band, so you got to <laughs> seal yourself off and get isolated, and and uh, whatever it takes. And me, it was alcohol was the fuel, and uh, you know, it it uh, to to get the job done to fulfill the contract. Was the alcohol a result of the pressure? Yeah, 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 I suppose. I, my, my first, uh, I, I was straight for my first couple of albums. But then it started to build up and you had to, you know. My third album probably is one of the best albums I ever made. Uh, 
just as I was getting into where the alcohol was working really well by this point. Mm -hmm. But it sustained itself all through the 70s. I made about another eight or nine albums. With mega hits. Ten, maybe. And, uh, you know, just kept cranking them out. And you confirmed the Kathy Smith song, right? The the story about... Yeah, well, she was out with the girls the night that I wrote that one. Every time she got out with the girls, I used to get worried. <laughs> you were dating Kathy Smith, that's right. Why, because she was so, so beautiful and so engaging? Yeah, she and... was a beautiful, <laughs> a beautiful lady, yeah. I, I'm glad that we had three years together. I, I, yeah. I really am. It was, it was memorable. And what a song to come out of it. Yeah, well, you know, it wasn't really because of her that I I wrote it. I was I was on a roll. I was... I was writing my my sundown album and getting ready to go on a canoe trip, and I was trying to get the songs done before I went on the canoe trip, so that I could get have them all, most of them ready to go by the time I got off the trip, which was a twenty eight day trip. Which one is this one? The Quebec one or up north? Or this one was uh, this one was the uh, uh, I forget it was the Rupert, the East Main. The Back, the Kazan, the Copper Mine. Let me think now. You've done a lot of canoe trips. ten of them. <laughs> I think it was the Copper Mine River. So you're about to go on the Copper Mine River. You've got to get these yeah. songs done. And this one's just floating in your head. You had a melody. So again, I was doing a whole bunch of them. A whole, a whole bunch of them. I got another good one in there about George and Bay, too, called Seven Island Suite. And, uh, but, I, I mean, it, uh, it was to get it done. So I, the, I was just, it became like kinetic energy. Mm-hmm. So I could... You know, getting to leave for the trip at the same time to pack, and uh, it's a good thing somebody else is buying the food. I got that job one other year, <laughs> buying all the food. You gotta, you know. You gotta get for how many guys were you out with? How many people were you out? Two, four, right. six is the most I've ever been on a, on a trip with. Usually four is the best one. Two canoes, four guys. Keep it simple. Do you ever go out solo? No, no. I've met people who have yeah. in kayaks. I met a guy in a kayak going upstream, upstream on the copper on the Churchill River one time. We did the Churchill River from mm-hmm. Lac Isle La Crosse down to uh, Flin Flon, Manitoba one time, and, and all of a sudden one day I found a guy coming upstream. And uh, some people do it that way. Did you ever? I mean, Prime Minister Trudeau was a big canoeer. Did you ever have celebrity a lot of buddies? Lakes, a lot of lakes too. Yeah. Uh, no, I never had a trip with him. But some of the people I traveled with did. Eric Morse. Mm-hmm. Uh, travel with him and uh, I, I talked to him a little bit about canoe tripping one time and uh, he's, he's done a couple of trips you know yeah. Trudeau he made a couple of trips do you and the Prime Minister share tips on canoe trips not much no not much just uh, I, I was usually like, totally in awe of him like mo- most people were so I was always kind of shy when mm-hmm. you know I'd be at, at events that he would be at so Gordon when you're at home strumming a guitar now do you have songs? Are you are you jotting stuff down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. What's right, right now, my, my my third wife is trying to force me to to record some of this stuff. <laughs> I've only been married to her for a month. I'm going to have to get the uh, <laughs> get organized. We have to get organized. Yeah, I've got one called Twenty Four Hour Blues, which is kind of a cute little one. I found out that somebody else had a song by that title about. 35 years ago but you don't you don't copyright a title no you can't so I'd be okay with that one so and how do you feel about getting into a studio and recording again well Bob asman has been talking to me about it but I you know it's like it, it's just getting around to it you know and, and it, it it's the family thing it, it's the family thing I like to spend my time staying prepared which is uh you know, doing physical exercise and that kind of stuff, and and hey, you go hard. You work out all the time, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I can't, I'm actually quite devoted to it, and it took a long time to get it, get around to that way. I really get good at it. Really, after the illness that almost killed me in 2002, mm-hmm. and uh, I yeah, started was, to get like really serious. That was pretty it. scary when news started to come out. Well, it was only a burst artery. I mean, I mean, only. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's like the the hose in your automobile, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it's uh, it was deep inside. It was it was an aneurysm, an aortic aneurysm, and uh, so uh, it t- it, t- it took uh, twenty eight months between gigs. Twenty eight months between gigs. On, it's quite a long time on that one, yeah. 
and you had been used to being a road dog, like you were touring a lot, right? Well, we were working hard. We were going going at it with a vengeance, right? When, when that, all of a sudden, boom, I'm, it, it's done. We're, right. we're getting ready to record. We've got the, again, I've got the material ready. And uh, we've got, to, we, we had to, 24 dates coming up in the fall and we were going to try some of this stuff out because back in that time, you know, there weren't people who were going to steal it on their on their cell phones, you know. <laughs> and we were going to get a chance to see how some of these songs worked. You know, did they have momentum? What was the response going to be like, you know? And and I felt really good about four or five of them, but we never got a chance to do that. So what we used for our, my last album, the Harmony album, were, were practice tapes tapes that I made of that a year before the illness took place so do you have a desire to take some of those songs and do them now I would do the whole thing o over again right now we'll get I Bob Ezrin on the phone <laughs> no but but, but 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 think about it this way it, it was a wonderful diversion that lasted for 14 months in in working having the guys going to the studio working on those tapes I I did not think about my condition in any way right. and it made my recovery actually more Effective. And you, know, you so. started to hit the gym. All I thought about was the album. I was 19 months between gym classes. So when you're in the gym now, are there people running on a treadmill beside you who certainly look over and think, holy shit, that's Gordon Lightfoot? I, 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 they're so used to me there. I go there all every day almost. They're, they're just, they're just, they get used to me. I, sometimes they'll say, when are you going to cut your hair? And I say, oh, no, just... <laughs> It's for the show. It's What's for the show people? that we do this. What are they, 150? You know? Who's telling you to cut your hair? Well, so, so, you know, uh, yeah, so I'm like, when are you going to cut your hair? <laughs> <laughs> You've been hearing That's, that your whole life. Uh, no, they're all, they're, 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 they're good Joes over there. We got, there's a ladies club too, the Adelaide club. Like they're, they're, they, they're, they're not connected, but, but. Do you, uh, you know, those guys, the 70s and the late 60s, do you guys ever still connect? Do you ever stumble across Chris Christopherson or Bob or any of those guys or even Joan? Well, I saw I was in Bob's dressing room a, a month ago with about five of my family members at the uh, at the Sony Theater. I don't know how they, why he ever let us all in there. But <laughs> well, Bob is notoriously <laughs> private about that. We were that. doing selfies. My daughter was doing selfies. Bro, a Bob Dylan selfie is out he, of this uh, world. He, he was very accommodating. He, he always he's always been a good friend. I know him back because I was managed by the same office. That's right. So that's how I got to meet him originally. Right. And so what was that like? Do you guys stay in touch regularly, or was it just nice to see him again? No, but when he would come to town, we we would party in in Rosedale. It was handy. So we get all the people over into Rosedale. I had a great big house there for a long time. I had to leave. I got outvoted when I got married for the second time. Yeah, I voted by me. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, who outvoted you? Your family? <laughs> <laughs> Got outvoted. Had to move. <laughs> but it was a great party house. When, when they did the Rolling Thunder, the place was full of people for two or three days there. That's one of the greatest tours in history. Yeah, yeah. So they had me on the show. Yeah. Joan didn't want me on, but Bob said he's going on anyway. I don't care what you say. Why didn't Joan want you on? I don't know. <laughs> she never told Joan by ass. She never told you. No, I never got along very well with her either because I used to date her sister. You used to date her sister? <laughs> yeah. Well, that would be a big reason as to why. Uh, Sisters, they, got, they, they keep together. <laughs> as they should. <laughs> to protect them. <laughs> so you're not the book writing kind of guy. No, no. I. I but I like to... Gordon, what a, what a litany of stories you have. I know. The, the book, uh, they want it to be in the first person and... Boy, that's holding me up because I haven't got that kind of patience to do that. <laughs> but also, you're you're big into like sending out good wishes and positive messages, and to write a good book like that, you have to tell some stories that some people probably don't want reprinted. I know there's some stories I I can't tell. Yeah, you can tell us one. Oh, geez. no one's listening. It's oh, just us. No, Gordon, it's just no, us. George, please, <laughs> please, George. Okay, <laughs> God. No. Okay, one half I, halfway story. Well, I don't know. So there's uh, there's the, the time that we broke into the old hotel in Bryn Mawr, uh, Pennsylvania, and almost got arrested. Okay, who's the we? Who who did that? John Stockfish and Rand and I. You did. <laughs> the wives came down that weekend. I tell you, the wives got news of a, of the party and that was going on, and <laughs> the wives came down, flew down from Toronto to to Philadelphia to keep an eye to keep an eye on us. 
uh, that's the kind of stuff, yeah. We, we, we just got out of the place when the police arrived. Why did you break in, just because? Well, there was a window open, and it was a, you know, it was an old hotel right in the middle of a, of a clover leaf. It was asking for it? And, and a highway. There was a highway going by on one side, <laughs> and, the, and the people were driving by. And we were in there, and, and, and then lighting matches so we could find our way around. And <laughs> I guess somebody saw the, the matches driving by, and somebody called the cops. <laughs> And uh, and I I thought about you know what a kerfuffle what a, what a terrible kerfuffle that would have been if we'd have gotten arrested for for doing that and just as we got out we're walking away from the place the police arrived and they just you're just a bunch the lights of lights ablazing long haired hippie walking down the street no one cared but your hair was shorter then and curlier it was sort of like yeah I still I still had to, I think I had it bobbed I think I had it, I had it bobbed one time, and it lasted for 17 years. <laughs> just the one bob. Yeah. Just a, I got it bobbed once. It lasted for 17 years, and, and it, as soon as I quit drinking, it went straight. You're like, I'm done with the bob. Yeah. Got got the permanent from Sandy Boso, the barber. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know him, don't everybody knows everybody Sandy. Knows Sandy. Yeah. Oh, what a pleasure. What's it, so earlier I asked you to play a song that that wasn't one of yours. What's your song that every time you play it, it warms you up? Well, if if, if it doesn't, I, I wouldn't be playing it. But there's got to be one that you hold. <laughs> that it has to have the momentum. Uh, I like playing playing it restless, <sighs> or early morning rain, or. Yeah. or if you could read my mind or the wreck of the Evan Fitzgerald. Or I'm playing all of them. Quixote or you know, Don Quixote. Uh, oh, I'm playing them all. There, there's, there's a ton of them. Uh, we've got about 40 songs always ready to go on a show. We only do about 26, 27 tunes. So if people are calling out requests, you're okay with it? They, they don't. People are, are getting starting to understand me a little bit better now out there. In which way? crowd. Well, we they they sort of let me do my thing now. They don't we don't get as many requests as we used to, and we don't care because we we've I've always got it worked out before I get out there what I'm going to do. I've always I've always got it worked out. Mm -hmm. And doing a two hour show, you gotta you gotta have it worked out, and that's got to flow, and everything's got to be completely different from everything else. And I can throw one in if I get a request. I can drop it in. Mm -hmm. If it's in the right key or the right tempo, so it doesn't throw my my pacing off. Are you a reflective man? Do you think about the life you've led? Do I ever? Yeah, I do. I regret some things. I've I've been in a state of repentance for a long time now. How's that feel? It feels good. It's 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 felt better at some times. It has it at other times. But right now, it feels pretty good. It has, it's, it's, it's been better, but right now it's pretty good. Making amends is a hard thing yeah. sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, trying to be nice, trying to be, trying to be a decent human being. You know, I, I, I like to be kind, I like to be nice to people, I like to be polite. Mm -hmm. Not like some of my kids, <laughs> you know. But when I you like were their age, polite. how are you? Huh? When you were their age, how are you? There, uh, well, uh... I was in Aurelia, mm -hmm. a, a very small, you know, very small town. And I guess I was like all the other, uh, the other little dorks around town. <laughs> and you know, we we went into sports and went into barber shopping and into operettas and into I, I sang with a dance band and and did all kinds of stuff in high school. I think in your yearbook, I saw a picture that Colton had sent me. Um, I was too busy to to really be in the trouble to get into trouble so you reflect and you have regrets but you feel pretty good now you're still young that's the thing like you're still the young guy so no just, I'm not yes I, you are no, I'm not <laughs> you're young you're not 90 years old you're young well whatever. although 90 could be young too I suppose well, you know it's uh, you know you, you, can, you can keep it that way but the, but the trouble is there's, there's, you gotta pay the piper to do it that way that's, that's the problem you gotta pay the piper you know, you gotta try and eat the right food. You gotta stay, 
try, try and stay in shape. Do you eat the right food? Try and stay ready. Yeah. Do you think about things you still want to do? Well, I can I, I, I can still get my personal life straightened out, and other than that, I want to do great shows, just just great shows. That's all I want to do is just do the best shows. I've got a wonder, a wonderful band right now. They're just it's the best band I've ever had right now, and that reinvigorate you. We got the crowd, we got the people. We're doing it on ticket sales alone, and. Uh, we're making we're we're making a profit, you know. Yeah. Everybody's getting paid. We got a, a nice travel system set up. We use a, a truck, a bus, and an airplane. Truck carries the equipment. The 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 base the the band the the bus takes the stage crew, hmm. the road manager. And. Uh, the band takes the airplane, and we have one extra now. My my little new little lady, mm -hmm. she's becoming the secretary to I, I and the, myself and the road manager. That's because she's heard about all your touring. She's she travels in the lounge, the, <laughs> the airplane. <laughs> That's all right. What a pleasure to see. She you. loves it back there. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Okay. Thanks for your time. Yeah. yeah.